Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel, Happy Cells and Souls. I am Julie Powers and I'm a licensed Zumba instructor and I'm a business partner with the Juice Plus Company. And my mission in life is to inspire healthy living around the world and to help people know that life is better when they're dancing through it. But my expanded mission is to create better health at the cellular level and more joy at the cellular level because we only get one body to live in while we're here on earth. And I believe that we are supposed to be happy while we're here. I believe we're supposed to be filled with joy and that we spread that out to the world around us. Um, in my life, I've had the honor and privilege of meeting some remarkable people. And one of those people is Ursula Warren, who we're gonna be talking with today. Um, my feeling is that Everybody has a story to share and everybody has something that we can learn from. And so it doesn't matter if we're coming from different political beliefs, religious beliefs, cultural beliefs, it doesn't matter where, our, where we fall on the socioeconomic ladder. Everybody can learn something from every other person because if we're not learning, we're not growing and we don't wanna be just stagnant and dying, right? So, Today, we're gonna to talk with Ursula, who has been a friend of mine for a very long time. And we used to work on a lot of community projects together, but then our lives segued into a whole new section where we were able to dance together because as we know, life is better when you're dancing through it. And Ursula has been part of that journey with me as well. And I love that. And now, Ursula, for I don't remember how many years now, but she has been connected with hospice. And a lot of times people think hospice, that means you're dying and I don't want to be a part of it. I don't want to know about it. It's taboo. But I have learned enough about hospice to recognize that it is something that can create joy and happiness for individuals and for families. And so I would like for Ursula to kind of help us understand what hospice is, fact or fiction, and just bring us into you know, some knowledge so that we are able to pass that along to the people that we care about when the time comes. So tell us, Ursula. Really, that was awfully nice of you. <laughs> It has been fun dancing through this last few years with you, and I appreciate you so much, Julie. Um, hospice is really um, a very different thing than most people recognize. Um, hospice, the main goal of hospice is to help people reach their goals as they come towards the end of their life. A lot of people believe, fact or fiction, hospice is for the last six days of your life, for the last seven days of your life. And so people suffer through illnesses, disease, and things like that without help um, because they don't recognize that help is available. But truly, hospice is designed for the last six to eight months of your life. And our goal is to find out what your goals are and make sure you meet them. Um, it's really can be quite a beautiful and joyful thing to do. We uh, Sometimes a patient's goal is simply to live without pain for the rest of their days but sometimes there are deeper issues that need to be taken care of for people before they move on uh, and transition out of their earthly life. And so our primary purpose is to meet all of those goals, to take care of their pain so they can live their best life right up until they are finished. Um, I can tell you, we've had um, patients who, who their entire goal is to um, take a drive in a convertible and eat a cheeseburger at a diner. And, um, and when they, we can get them out of pain enough to be able to do that, guess what we do? We find a convertible and we go find a burger at a diner. Because at that point in your life, if that's your goal, we want to make sure you get to do it. It's like a miniature Make-A-Wish program. It kind of ex <laughs> exactly is that. It's a very local um, and, it's, and it's so important because sometimes the goals are more important goals um, and, and deeper, you know, soul intensive goals. I can tell you a few years ago, we had a patient who had a son he had not seen in 10 years. He hadn't spoken with them. He had no idea where he was. He had no knowledge of this child that he had not seen in 10 years. He told our social worker that, and his goal was to say goodbye to his son. Uh, it took us several weeks 
of searching and we found him. Unfortunately, he was in prison. Oh my. Yes, which was very difficult. But what we couldn't do was work it out where he could come home and see his dad. But what we could do is take his dad to see him. So uh -huh. two nurses and, um, and a social worker, we went to prison and we visited his son one last time. Wow. Wow, what a blessing. And so that was, that was something that never would have happened if hospice wasn't there to, you know, put all the pieces together, right? Exactly. And the mailman's here. My dog is going to save me from him. So I apologize for that. <laughs> My dog saves me every day from the wicked mailman. Right, right. Well, we understand, you know, we have, we have lives going on behind the camera. And so it's okay if there's background noise. Um, you know, I, I think that these stories that you're sharing, things that make us understand that hospice is not just about sitting with somebody in a dark room with a candle holding their hand while they're they take their last breath, which is what I think a lot of people believe. Um, and it's also not just for the patient. Hospice care is for enveloping the whole family, right? In this like big compassionate hug and you know, kind of seeing to the needs of the family while they watch their loved one transition. So um, can you tell exactly. us more about that? Absolutely. You're exactly right. Um, we do take care of the patient and that is so extremely important, but their uh, family members a lot of times are dealing with something they've never dealt with before. It might be the biggest crisis of their lifetime. It might, whether it's a parent or a spouse, or sometimes it's even their child. An adult child but we are also you know the hospice I work for happens to take care of children who are terminally ill as well so it is a crisis situation when you're losing someone you love we have an entire team of people who are uh, trained and qualified and mo and very experienced at helping people go through this process and work through the emotions that are associated with it but also educate you on the best ways to take care of your loved one when we're not in the room so it doesn't feel crazy. And I can tell you from personal experience, I lost my mother when I was 28 years old. And, and it's the reason that I now work in hospice is leukemia and she was on hospice. And- um, Okay, your, your sound went out a little bit. What did you say she had leukemia? She had leukemia uh -huh. and um, she was on hospice. And it was my first experience with, with uh, hospice of any kind. I, was, I had no idea. What hospice was about and so, that was 20 something years ago many many well, some you know i didn't even know that hospice hospice existed that at that time of life so right it me either it was something so brand new that when the doctor said well there's nothing more we can do we're going to call in hospice we all went oh my gosh they're calling in hospice you know it, it was horrifying people think that's a death sentence Yes, they do. That is another factor fiction. It's absolutely not a death sentence. Okay. Uh, we don't change. We don't hasten death, nor do we hold it off. The process happens very naturally. What we do is keep your quality of life the very best it can be while that process takes place. But when my mother was on hospice, there, the hospice nurse, the very last day, my mom died on Christmas. So um, Christmas morning, we went to the hospital. We gathered around her. We, she was doing well that day. And she was in inpatient hospice uh, at the hospital. We opened gifts. We had a wonderful day. And as evening went on, everyone went home except for me. And I sat with my mom. And she began to decline rapidly. Kidneys failed. Organs started shutting down. Her breathing, she had long periods of apnea. Um, and I'm just a kid losing my mom. And I'm freaking out. I'm like, every time she'd stop breathing, I would yell, mom, you know, and she would breathe again. Um, there was a nurse there from the, uh, the hospice and she sat with me the last few hours. And I said to her, you know, I have a very important meeting at work tomorrow and I have to be there. Am I going to be there? And she said, no, honey, you're not going to be there. Okay. Should I call my, the rest of the family? She said, yes, I think you should. So I did. They got there in plenty of time. And we were with mom when she passed. So was this nurse. Her name is Kathy, by the way. I don't know her last name. I never knew her last name. But I, this was a long time ago, 1995. And I can see her face as clearly as I can see yours. 
because this crazy, awful thing that was happening in this room, she made it somehow okay, normal. Like she, we knew what to expect. We, she kept us surprised of what was happening. She helped us work through the entire process until my mom took our last breath. And it was, I didn't recognize it at the time, but years later when I look back, I thought, I don't think I would have made it through that without Kathy. Right. Kathy know how she impacted my life with what she did for my mother, but also for me. And so it was such a beautiful thing that I knew that was something I wanted to be a part of. And I'm so honored and thrilled that I do get to be a part of that every single day, not just a part of, of you know, helping people with the process of dying, but all of the wonderful goals and things we get to do while they're with us. You know, I, I love that you were able to take a really deeply traumatic experience that turned into such a beautiful thing because you know i i was i was there when my daughter took her last breath in a hospital mm -hmm. and being part of that moment when when our souls leave our bodies mm -hmm. it is the most unusual and i amazing experience that is completely stamped on your heart and i mean you you can never separate yourself from that and i've only had that experience once in my life to be in the room when someone passed and my belief is that we're able to move on into the next portion of our lives um that doesn't inc include this stuff you know this flesh that we have hanging on our bones right um, right and so um i just i just think that's amazing because you work with such um an incredible staff of professionals and volunteers who are able to be there for the family and to help really map out what is happening like you said like when things are happening with the body they're there to explain this is what's happening and this is you know about what's going to happen in the next few minutes in the next few hours in the next few days sometimes they're not exactly right because we all have our own things going on but most of the time they know what they're talking about and so i think that's amazing um now you were talking about being in the hospital with your mother when she passed a lot of hospice care is done in the homes and sometimes in the hospital, but also in uh, long-term nursing facilities, assisted living facilities and things like that, right? So how does, how does that work exactly? Exactly, a lot of people don't realize that hospice does work. And not only can we come into your home and take care of you when you need us, but we can also take care of your loved one while they're in the hospital or while they're in, an, in a facility a long-term care facility, when you, um, when you reach a, a terminal diagnosis and recognize that you're in the last six to eight months of your life, you get to choose um, if you want help. And if you do, which hospice you would, like to, uh, you would like to help you through that. And it's very important to do your research. Better to do it before you need it than when you need it. But it's very important to carefully select uh, a hospice based on whatever philosophy that they have for how they help you. We're all very different. But in a long-term care facility, there are nurses and CNAs that are gonna take care of your day-to-day, -day, every hour needs within the facility. What the hospice does is we come in um, and we are an additional set of eyes, an additional doctor, an additional nurse practitioner, an additional nurse and CNA. We'll take care of your personal needs. We'll take care of your bathing, your nail care, cut your hair. If you're a man, we'll give you a nice shave. We take care of all of your personal needs for you. So the nursing home or, or long-term care facility doesn't have to worry about it. But more importantly, we are there specifically several times a week to assess what's going on, take care of your medications. A lot of people don't know this, but when you're on hospice, we pay for your medications. You don't pay for them anymore. We take care of it. Wow, that's amazing. It is amazing. And so I work for a not-for-profit hospice, which is very different from a for-profit hospice. But for us, our patients never receive a bill for our services. We see them five times a week, minimum. And we and pay- these, like hour-long visits, or are they- You know, it depends what the patient needs. Sometimes it's an hour-long visit, sometimes it's a 24-hour visit. It just depends on what you need. Um, and the patient never pays a dime for that? Never, not a nickel. Oh. And okay. they will never see a bill from us. And we take care of their medications. We take care of rental of any equipment that they need, oxygen, 
we pay for all of that. And, and how do you do that? How do you guys fund that as a nonprofit hospice versus the for-profit? Well, it's challenging. I can tell you that. we, um, If a person has private insurance, Medicare or Medicaid, we will bill those things and accept whatever payment they provide. If they provide no payment, then we accept no payment. Um, to make up for that, we do have to fundraise, and that's what we do. Um, sometimes we will take such good care of patients, well, we always take great care of patients, but sometimes the patient's family will ask for donations made to our organization in lieu of flowers. Right, um, right. We'll tribute to their loved one, which we greatly appreciate and can always use, because fundraising uh, becomes very important to us. Right, right. Oh, that's, that's great. Um, and it's going to become much more challenging in the post-coronavirus days <laughs> and, and the world that we're going to be living in for who knows how long, um, where the economy is going to be a little, little off for a while. So um, I, I have also heard, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that there are people that are in hospice care for six or eight months and then they go into remission or they get well enough that they're like, I'm out of here. I'm not doing hospice anymore. And then they might come back on hospice two or three years later. Um, so it, this is something that happens, right? It does happen. We actually have graduations. We have people, we take such great care of them, their health improves and it improves enough they don't need us anymore. And that is a very happy day for us, but it's an even more happy day for them. And we have had patients uh, on our service multiple times. As their health would decline, we would go in and take care of them. And when they were well enough, they didn't need us, we could discharge them and they moved on until uh, such time as they needed us again. And we're so glad when that can happen. That's the other piece of the, it's not a death sentence. You know, if you don't need us, it's always a choice. And if you don't need us, that's great. Um, that makes us happy too. Right. So, so one of the fictional things that people might believe about hospice is that um, when you're in your last days, um, hospice comes in and starts cranking up the morphine and, and they're like, please, please help me in this. And you're like, you know, some Dr. Kevorkian service. Um, but that is not the case. You are there to provide the utmost care and to make the last days or months for someone or hours to be the best possible without progressing them toward that end, right? Um, so is there anything you want to say about that as well? You're absolutely right. Um, we are asked frequently, can you help us? Can you help? I don't want to do this anymore. Can you help me? And the answer to that is no, that's not something we can do at all. Um, but what we can do is make sure that you have the medication you need to control the pain that you have. Um, but not only that, medication you may need to control your anxiety and fears, because it can be a very anxious time um, my sister passed away from cancer um, many years ago, and she was on hospice, and she told me one time, I'm not afraid to die, but I'm terrified of the process. And so it can be, it can be very anxious and very upsetting trying to anticipate what is coming. So we can also provide um, counseling, but also medications if necessary to help control that anxiety so it's not such a scary time. But what we never do is hasten death for anyone. And, but we also don't prolong it. Um, we, we, we let the process of transitioning from this life to whatever your concept of the next life is. Like you, I believe that this is just a step in the process moving on to something else. But we let that happen very naturally and just provide as much relief as we can and as much joy as we can along the way when a patient's pain and anxiety are controlled. They can meet their goals, do the things they really want to do with the rest of their days, and then pass very um, peacefully on into the next life. Well, I think that that is a great way to end this conversation in just saying that hospice can be very happy. And uh, that's what I love about this life is that we get to be happy while we're here. And you do work for um, a, a hospice facility, a hospice organization, nonprofit, as we said, that is in uh, Missouri. And there are several offices, right, that you work with, or is it just the one? We're just one. We're actually 
small independent not-for-profit hospice. We have one office and we serve nine counties. Okay, so that's why I was thinking that there were some smaller satellite offices, but it's just the one office. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the information in the um, text below this video as to how to contact you and your organization directly so that if someone wants to find out more about, um, it is Serenity Hospice, and if they want to find out more about Serenity and how you can donate to it, how you can request services, or how you can maybe even become a volunteer to help, you know, with the organization, um, then they'll be able to contact you directly. But again, doesn't matter where you live or what your insurance um, is, you should go ahead and look into the hospice services that are available in and around your area because you may have a number of options and in our area we have a lot of options for hospice and yes. a couple that are not for profit and several that are for profit and it's just what's going to make you the most comfortable with the staff members that are available so seek out that information now um, especially if you have someone who is in a you know a health condition that could lead to you know needing hospice services in the near future so Anything else you want to just wrap this up with, Ursula? You know, I would just say um, I'm, I'm very blessed to get to do this because I believe it is a, a beautiful and wonderful thing to pass peacefully into the next life. And uh, it's an honor to get to help people with that situation. I would love to answer any questions anyone would have. And if you'll put down the phone number in the comments, um, if you have questions at all, I would love to talk to them and they can feel free to call me anytime. All right. Thank you so much for sharing this fact or fiction. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you, Julie. It was fun.